Hey there, friend. I have a little challenge for you to consider. Imagine if you could build each day on a foundation so strong that nothing, not your worries, not your schedule, not even a cranky mood, could knock you off course. Today, we're talking about the simple, powerful habit of Thanksgiving. Now, before you think you've heard it all, I'm going to share something with you that might just change the way you approach every single day and night. I've got bookends, if you will, for your day, something to hold you together. So get ready to unwrap a daily rhythm of gratitude that can keep your heart anchored no matter what comes your way. Welcome to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. I'm Dana Gresh. Now, before I tell you about those bookends for your day, Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth wants to point you to the true meaning of gratitude. She's teaching on Psalm 92. Verse 1 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Here's Nancy reflecting on that verse. We know through all of Scripture that God is good, even when everything else around us seems to be bad. God is good, and it is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord. Thanksgiving is a good thing. Praise to the Lord is a good thing. It's valuable. It's precious. It's worthwhile. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. And then we see the object of our praise. It is good to give thanks not just to some general cosmic something out there, nebulous something, but it is good to give thanks to the Lord to Yahweh, the self-existent one who is the creator of everything that is, who is the ruler and the sovereign and the providential God of the universe and of time past and time present and time to come for all of eternity. He is the Lord. We give our thanks to him. It is good to sing praise to your name, Most High, El Yon. The Most High God. He is exalted. He is above every person, every circumstance, every nation, every problem, every sin. He is above everything. He is the God Most High. And we give thanks to the Lord. We praise the Lord, the Most High God. That is the object of our praise. When we're giving thanks, when we're singing praise, we have lots of things to thank the Lord for, and it's appropriate to thank Him for those things, but we start by thanking Him for His covenant-keeping love, the love of God. It's not based on who we are or what we've done or what we could do for God or how we perform for Him. He loves us because He is a faithful, covenant-keeping God, and His loving kindnesses to us never cease. So we start the theme of our praise, the faithful love of God. And then as we continue in these first few verses of Psalm 92, we see not only the object of our praise and thanks, not only the theme of our praise and thanks, but also the expression of our praise and thanks. And the psalmist gives us some insight, as do other psalms throughout Scripture, but how we are to praise the Lord and when we are to praise the Lord. How? We are to give thanks and to praise the Lord in a variety of ways that we see in verses 2 and 3. We are to praise the Lord with our voices. It says, declare the faithful love and the faithfulness of God. I've been thinking about that as I get up in the morning and I want to declare the love of God, the faithfulness of God. That means to speak the love of God, to speak the faithfulness of God, to declare it first to the Lord. Lord, you are faithful. You are loving. You are kind. You are merciful. You never stop loving me. You never stop keeping me. Declaring to the Lord thanks and praise for his steadfast love and faithfulness. But sometimes we need to declare it to ourselves. Soul, you're upset. You're overwrought. You're anxious about this or that. I need to remind my soul, remind myself that God loves me that God is faithful no matter what is going on in this world or in my world this day. And I want to just say it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord all through the day and even as we awaken during the night. I think of that song we many of us sing at times in our corporate worship, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, Let me be singing when the evening comes. And what is his song? What are we going to be singing? Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship his holy name. 
Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. The steadfast love and the faithfulness of God are never ending. And our praise and our thanks should be never ending, morning and night and all the time in between, all the way to the end of our earthly lives and through all eternity. Look at verse four. For you have made me rejoice Lord. That word means to be glad, to brighten up. When somebody's happy, you can tell it by their face, right? Their countenance gets brighter. And the psalmist says, Lord, you have made me rejoice. You have brightened, you have gladdened my face, my countenance. You have made me rejoice. And then in that second half of that verse, I will shout for joy. You see, praise and thanksgiving are not supposed to be something we just keep totally within our own hearts. It doesn't have to always be a quiet exercise. It can be a very expressive exercise, singing aloud to the Lord. And I wanted to say, when you come together with the people of God on the Lord's Day for corporate worship, when they sing, I want to encourage you to sing. And the psalmist says, Lord, you have made me rejoice doesn't mean there aren't any problems. It doesn't mean there aren't any hard things going on in our lives. You look across the congregation on any given Lord's Day, and there are lots of people who have deep pain in their lives and in their circumstances. Maybe you do as you worship the Lord. But in the midst of that, the psalmist says, you have made me rejoice. You have brightened my heart, my face. You have gladdened me. I will shout for joy. I will express the joy that you put in my heart because of who you are. Now, what causes that kind of response? What's the source of our thanksgiving and praise? What's the source of our joy? Well, it's not something that we can just conjure up. I'm going to be a happy person. I'm going to sing clappy, happy songs, and I'm going to pretend like I'm happy. That's not what we're talking about. And the joy we're talking about is not rooted or grounded in what's going on around us, which may be painful, grievous, hard. So that's not the source of our joy. What is the source of our rejoicing and our joy? Well, the source of our joy is in who God is, his faithful love, his steadfast love, his loving kindness, and his faithfulness. That word in the Hebrew means literally firmness. We waffle, we waver, we shift, we go up and down sometimes with our emotions or with how we're feeling, but God is firm. The word faithfulness means security, stability. He is a steady, faithful God. When we're up and down, he is steady. He is faithful. So who God is, this is a reason for joy, for rejoicing, and for celebrating the goodness of God. Mm, I couldn't agree more. That's Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth reminding us that God is the source of our gratitude. We must thank Him because of who He is, not just when we feel like He's doing nice things for us. And did you hear the bookends for life? Nancy shared them when she taught from Psalm 92, 2. Thank God for His steadfast love in the morning, book end one, and thank Him for His faithfulness at night, book end two. A rhythm of thanksgiving to hold your life together. Now, we thank Him for His love every morning because it's our foundation for living. And then at the end of the day, when the world has maybe worn us down a bit, we thank Him for His faithfulness. Try it. You're going to be glad you did. Scott Melby recognized the importance of practicing that habit of thanking God in all circumstances. Scott was one of the Revive Our Hearts board members. Several years ago, he was diagnosed with an aggressive type of leukemia. Over the next few years, he went through many treatments and two bone marrow transplants. He, his wife Karen, and his whole family went through unimaginable suffering. Yet, they did not lose hope. In fact, they made it a point to continue to thank God even on the days when Scott was in terrible pain or they received more bad news. Let's listen to part of Nancy's conversation with Scott. This was recorded just a few months before he went home to be with the Lord in 2016. And once the initial shock wore off and we began to remind each other of all of the amazing stories of God's goodness during our first transplant, it really 
gave us such hope for the future. And isn't that mm-hmm. what we're supposed to do is, is to focus on God's goodness and to look back at his so many times where he has been faithful and has provided over and above. And because of that, we can have hope for the future because of what God has done and is doing in our lives. We can have, we can have hope for the future. And Scott, I have watched you, both of you, but it's just been astonishing to me. I guess it shouldn't be astonishing because you have a track record with God and he's proven himself faithful. But to see somebody in the fire, in the storm, just relentlessly clinging to what you know to be true about God when you are sick and weak and scared and really facing death, being in the hospital this last time, visiting that afternoon. And Scott, you are so, so sick. You're just writhing. You're shaking. You're not really aware of anything else going on around you. But periodically, you would just say something that could hardly be understood. It was quiet, but it was intense. And as I got closer, I could hear which two things you kept saying were, God has been so good to us. God has been so good to us. You would say that repeatedly. And the other thing you would say was, We've got so much to be thankful for. And I'm going, here is a man who is in the jaws of physical death, potentially, and you're saying we've got so much to be thankful for? I mean, how'd you get that perspective? (laughs) Why was that what was coming out of your mouth in that very, very low point? You know, Nancy, it's all of grace. where that came from. It came from God's grace that has been shown to us in so many areas. I think Karen and I had been fortunate enough to be raised with Christian parents and Christian grandparents and have really taken advantage of a significant amount of great Bible teaching in our lives. And I know that ROH is for women, but I love to listen in on the program as well, (laughs) Nancy. And so you've been part of that. And so we had a, a deep well of biblical knowledge that we could dig into that really helped us formulate the basis for how we're going to look at this. I think we've, Karen, I lost my dad three years ago, Karen lost her mom eight years ago, and we, they were both godly people and they both suffered significantly. And, and so it's been modeled for us how to go through suffering and to mm. watch my mom and Karen's dad walk alongside of a spouse that they love very much who is going through intense suffering, Mm -hmm. we were able to take away um, significantly from that as well. And I think just, you know, Nancy, in a time of turmoil, when the world is turning upside down, Scripture is the only true north we have. Mm -hmm. And so we threw ourselves into Scripture, and we would continually ask the Lord, you know, that the verse in Romans about renewing your mind, and we would say, Lord... We would pray back scripture to the Lord. You know, we would remind him of his promises. We would claim his promises. We would, you know, Lord, your your word says that you care about every detail of our lives, and we've got some details Mm -hmm. that we really need your help with. And we remind ourselves of that God promises to never leave us nor forsake us, that he's always with us, that his love never runs out. We can never reach the end of his love for us. And so really it was marinating our minds in Scripture. And marinating was the word we kept using. We have to keep going back to Scripture. And we all face times of suffering and illness and pain and stress and disappointment in life. And I want to encourage everyone to look at those as opportunities, to don't run from them, but to to remember that those experiences in our life I know I already said it already, but they only come into our lives by being sifted through the hands of an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And so, therefore, let's look and see what we can learn. So, lean into those times of suffering. And we really focus not not only on on saturating our minds with Scripture, but also, and we've talked about, about prayer, but we, you know, Nancy, your book on choosing gratitude really set... We read that years ago as a family, and that really set a platform of 
trying to go through this time of suffering and always looking for something to be grateful for. Because no matter how tough the situation is, there are always things to be grateful for. And we found that when we focused on gratitude, it really kind of redirected our thoughts automatically to God's goodness. Whereas when we focused on the pain and the what ifs and how is this going to work out, it always would lead down the path to, to fear and to anguish. And so we had a choice to make. And by doing it God's way and looking at these as an opportunity to draw closer to him, an opportunity to be refined into the men and women of, of Christ that he wants to turn us into, um, it gave us a whole different perspective on approaching the cancer journey. That was Scott Melby reflecting on God's goodness to him and his family You know, he never lost sight of that, even when things did not seem to be going well. His cancer treatments failed. Less than six months after that was recorded, his earthly body was buried. But his hope wasn't in this world, so he could still be thankful. What about you? Maybe you're going through something just as difficult as Scott and Karen Melby did. Or maybe it's something smaller, but it can still be a challenge to fix your eyes on Jesus. When you're faced with trials, I hope you'll decide to thank God in and through them, no matter what. You can do that because of your hope in God, but also, like Scott mentioned, expressing your gratitude to Him will actually increase your hope. When you're intentional about thanking God for who He is and what He's done, there's something else that happens. Because you recognize how unworthy you are of God's love and compassion, you want to show that kind of love to others. Kelly Needham talked about what that looks like. Now, she didn't use the words gratitude or thanksgiving, but I think you'll see how compassion flows out of gratitude to God. Here's Kelly. Compassion is a very, I'm moved to do something for somebody else. It is inward. It starts inside. A lot of the Hebrew uses of the word compassion, I want to ask my husband this. He had said he had talked to a Hebrew scholar, and he said the best way I could put language to that Hebrew word for compassion is warm womb. Warm womb, that there's a motherly, just emotive longing and and moving towards somebody out of compassion. That God looks at the people who have mistreated him and has compassion on them. My compassion grows warm and tender. It's shocking. It's shocking. Never in my life could I have that response to someone who has treated me that way. And God says, I know. I'm not like you. I'm God. I'm not man. I'm not like you. I don't come in my wrath. Now, how can that be, right? How can God extend such kindness? Because there is burning anger. There is wrath for sin. We know that, right? That Ephesians 2, 3 calls us children of wrath before we have been saved, that the wrath of God abides on those of us who are in sin? How can God do this? There's one reason. It's Jesus. Jesus is the only reason that God can extend this compassion. All we like sheep, yes, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That last verse, verse 10, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. I love the translation that comes from the NASB that says the Lord was pleased to crush him that if you look at the the word usage in the Hebrew of that word, it is across the board used as pleasure and delight in other parts of our Bible. That it was the pleasure and delight of God to crush his son. I have no concept of that. And that's, again, we're man. We're not like him. He was pleased to crush his son because his compassion for us is love for us. It is, it's not a choice. It's a, there's a, an internal compassion, kindness, love from God that is something that is so hard to fathom. I can't imagine it. 
1 Timothy 1.15 says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. Jesus came not to first give the wrath of God, but to come and receive the wrath of God so that we didn't have to. He came to bear our wrath for us so that he could come in the compassion of God to welcome us into his fellowship and friendship, though we have been his enemies and bent on turning away from him. He had compassion on us, and it is shocking. I think this is what helps motivate us to show compassion to others. I don't know who you struggle to be nice to, to be kind to, to feel like a tender feeling toward. For a lot of us moms, that could be our kids on any given day because we feel this a little bit in parenthood. I bend down and feed you every day and you don't give me a thank you? Have you ever felt that? We don't say it all the time. It sure rises up. I remember my daughter one day had just, it felt like from the moment she picked her sweet little head up from her bed until we were making it in the car to run some errands, probably only 11 a.m., it was constant complaints. I need, I need this. Why haven't you done this? Why isn't this working? And I was actually that morning really working hard to be patient. I remember that, Lord, give me patience. And I was doing really good for a while. And I had this moment right before we left where I just kind of blew up a little bit and raised my voice. And guys, I just need a second. I don't remember what I said. But again, I was working really hard, like, Lord, help me grow in this area. And so we got in the car and I buckled everybody up, had a moment to just breathe while everybody was strapped in. And I was gonna turn around and apologize to my daughter. Before I could get the words out, this comes from behind. Mommy, are you gonna apologize to me now? <laughs> Sweet girl. And you know what came out of me in that moment? Wrath. <laughs> I felt anger. No, I'm not gonna apologize to you. That's what, what is bubbling out of my heart. I don't have it. I don't have it, but the Lord does. And meditating on his compassion for me, soaking it in, thinking on it, meditating it, then I can remember that moment, Lord, I'm just like my daughter. Lord, are you gonna apologize to me for not giving me what I wanted when I wanted it? That's in my heart. And the Lord is patient and kind with me. And he pours out compassion on me. And as I think on that, that becomes so beautiful to me that then in that moment, I have strength to go, Lord, make me like you. I'd be, I wanna be more like you than like man, like humanity, and I can't do it. Would you help me? I don't know what need you have for the compassion of God and what it needs to move in you, but it's when we look to his compassion and his great mercy and his great empathy for people who are not deserving of it, it will actually motivate an overflow of that to those in our own lives. Kelly Needham has been looking at the compassion that flows out of those who've experienced God's compassion. The more thankful you are for what He's done, the more eager you are to show His love to others. You can't have a grateful heart and ignore pain and suffering around you. Makes you think, doesn't it? So I've got to ask, does your perspective need to change? If you're going through a difficult time right now, do you need to make a list of everything you can thank God for? And if your life is easy, do you take it for granted? Do you need to refocus on God and thank Him for all He's done? From your salvation to the pumpkins on your porch, there are so many things to be thankful for. Well, whatever your circumstances are right now, I think you'll find the newest Revive Our Hearts resource to be a great help in looking to Jesus. It's our 2025 wall calendar, and it's full of scripture and quotes from Nancy's book, Choosing Gratitude. Plus, it's just beautiful. When you give any amount this month in support of Revive Our Hearts, we'll send you next year's calendar when you ask for it. You can do that at reviveourhearts.com or call 1-800-569-5959. Now, we all know that the next few weeks, they're gonna be busy. Parties, concerts, and sweets will abound. It can be overwhelming, am I right? How do you approach this season with a welcoming, hospitable attitude? without going crazy. We'll talk about that next week, so be sure to join us. In the meantime, happy Thanksgiving, 
And thanks for listening today. I'm Dana Gresh. We'll see you next time for Revive Our Hearts Weekend. This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts in Niles, Michigan, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.